Our hymn is number 381, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Let us join together in singing the first and third verses of number 381. Please remain standing for the gospel lesson from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, which can be found on page 92 in the New Testament of your pew Bible. Now hear the word of the Lord. At that very time there was some present who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He told them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See there? For three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I remember climbing up onto the counter and getting my face so close to the mirror that it would fog up right in front of me. I'm not sure at what age this fascination ceased to be quite as captivating, but I have many memories of staring at myself in the mirror as a child. Sometimes it was to evaluate how loose a tooth was, carefully determining whether or not I could manage to get it out that day so that the tooth fairy might come and visit me that night. Other times it was to stare at my hair. I remember trying to force my hair to part down the center of my head because I thought that was cool, but relentlessly my part has always been right here on the side where it still is today. I remember going into the bathroom with my cousins as a child and turning off all the lights so that we might tell ghost stories into the mirror. The only light shining through was coming from the outside, a sliver of light coming underneath the doorway. I remember the first time I put contacts in my eyes, touching my eyeballs close to the mirror, and the day I got braces on my teeth. 
I remember getting acne as a teenager and wanting that reflection that I could see in the mirror with all those spots just to disappear. I remember looking at myself in the mirror when I was trying on a new outfit in the dressing room or when I got dressed for prom and trolled around in front of the mirror to admire it. I remember going into the bathroom as we watched my brother use his first razor and shaving cream for his first shave of those little hairs right above his upper lip, his inaugural move into manhood. I remember standing in the bathroom with my mom as she tried on wigs and scarves as she was going through chemotherapy and had lost all of her hair when I was a girl. I remember making silly faces and trying to act like Elvis Presley in the mirror, trying to raise just one side of my lip without my entire face looking distorted. I've practiced that one a lot, so if you want to see it after the service, come and I'll show you how I can do that. I remember trying to make one eyebrow raise without making the other eyebrow raise. I remember standing and trying to get my tongue to curl. I had a deep sense of wonder and fascination with all the ways my body would respond. And in some sense, discovering who I was as I stared in the mirror. As I share all these things, it almost sounds like my entire life has unfolded in front of a mirror. And while that is not at all the case, it is one place where I can remember standing and trying to understand and accept and appreciate who I am. You might be able to recall other rituals or memories from your own childhood or different points in your lives that involve time spent in front of a mirror. Some people talk to themselves in the mirror. Some people write notes on a mirror or stick sticky notes on the mirror as a form of motivation or encouragement. Mirrors are fascinating things. They allow us to see ourselves exactly as we are. They reflect what we look like, yes, but they often even reflect how we're feeling or what we're going through. The reflection is a pure, raw truth of ourselves. As a teenager, I am sure that I stared into the mirror, probably comparing myself to others more than being fascinated with my own uniqueness as I had as a young child. Many of us often reflect that we don't like what we see in front of them in, as we look in the mirror. Perhaps most especially as we're a teenager, but also as we get older, we begin to see wrinkles and maybe the shade of our hair changing colors in front of us. But mirrors are important and beautiful. They invite us to accept ourselves for who we are. Mirrors don't speak anything to us. There are no words, but there is a message. This is who you are. It, mirrors don't judge or compare. They simply reflect what's real in front of us. We are the ones who often start evaluating or critiquing or trying to perfect something. And it's most often in comparison to someone else and other people, and not for the betterment or the encouragement of ourselves. The gospel message today is holding a mirror up for us. The two opening stories in Luke talk about people who are trying to feel better about who they are and their own shortcomings by comparing themselves to the sins and actions of others. They say, well, what about those murderers, Jesus, the ones who Pilate mixed their blood with the blood of our sacrifices that we were offering to God? At least we didn't do what they did. Surely we are better than them. But Jesus says, No, I tell you that unless you repent, you will perish as they did. And then another group 
Well, what about those who died in Siloam? At least we weren't a part of what was going on there. But Jesus says the exact same thing again. No, I tell you that unless you repent, you will perish as they did. They weren't wanting to look into a mirror. They were hoping they could avoid their own reflection by holding a mirror up to other people. Well, Jesus can see what's going on in this context, in in this culture. These are his fellow Galileans, after all. They're Jesus' hometown folks. They are actually kind of testing Jesus and wanting to see if he's loyal and he's going to be on their side and if he's going to be about their agenda. Jesus is listening, and he's seeing what folks are talking about and thinking about. He's watching how easily they are getting caught up in this politics present in in their society. And when they ask him some questions, likely hoping they would get the response that they wanted, he responds in a way that he hopes will provide clarity and motivation. But they don't quite get it. Or maybe they don't like what he's saying exactly. So in classic Jesus fashion, he uses a parable or a story to explain in different terms what he has already just told them. He tells the story of a fig tree. There was an owner of a vineyard, and in his vineyard he had a fig tree. The fig tree's owner came every year for three years in a row to collect fruit. But each year that he came, there was no fruit on the tree. And so he finally told the caretaker, just cut it down. He thought, why should I waste this space and the soil on a tree that's not producing anything? But the caretaker said, no, let's not do that quite yet. Let me dig up around it and put some manure, some fertilizer, some compost on it and care for it over this next year. And then after that, if it doesn't produce any fruit, As you say, we can cut it down. The season of Lent is about manure. These 40 days leading up to Easter are about putting fertilizer on our lives. Lent is an invitation to evaluate ourselves. It's about looking in the mirror and seeing what is in front of us. Jesus isn't mad or angry at the Galileans, but he sees that they are missing the point. And like the fig tree, are not producing any fruit themselves because they are so caught up in others around them and comparing themselves to others. Jesus says, stop looking around and recognize that you yourselves are not living to your fullest potential. You're not growing fully into the possibilities of who you are by comparing themselves to others, and not even others who are doing good, but others who are caught up in evil and difficulty. Jesus says, this will not do. This is not what you are to compare yourself to or evaluate evaluate yourselves with they are not the standard or the measurement look inside look at yourself we've also entered into a presidential political season a season where we spend a lot of time and a whole lot of money on ads and campaigns that seem to be more about holding the mirror up in front of other people instead of being focused on possibility and self. And right now, the focus is still largely on Republicans doing this with Republicans and Democrats with Democrats. But pretty soon, it's going to turn into party candidates against one another, a whole new layer of accusations and comparisons. And while I wish I could say this culture of blame and pointing fingers is only an ill of our political culture. 
I'm afraid that it's accurately a representation of today's culture and society as a whole. The one that we are all a part of. This is just the televised version. And this is when many of us want to point and say, well, at least I'm not that bad. Pointing to any political candidate or party of your choice. Some of us want to disassociate ourselves altogether during this political season. As we watch these different debates happen and the the political culture around us, we want to say, I can't believe this is going on. Or we think, surely I can't make any difference, so what does it matter? But to use Jesus' words, no, I tell you, unless you repent, you will perish as they did. Did you hear the parable? Comparing ourselves to others is not what allows us to thrive and to bear fruit. If we live in a way that only evaluates based on other people, we might just find that our tree is full or bare and empty depending on who we are comparing ourselves to. And as Jesus indicated, it's not about what others are doing or not doing. It's about being willing to evaluate our own lives. About being willing to hold the mirror up in front of ourselves. Jesus says twice, no, I tell you, unless you repent, you will perish as they did. I don't believe that Jesus here is saying that anyone will literally die. What he is concerned about, what he is talking about, what he is alluding to is our spiritual health and well-being. He's talking about living into the potential of who we are created to be. What does the caretaker of the vineyard do to that fig tree? He doesn't just wait another year without doing anything, does he? He digs around it. He freshens the soil. Nothing will happen if he doesn't do this. It's the digging around that affords us the opportunity to find ways that we can care and serve and express ourselves. And that is when we have even the possibility of bearing fruit. And one of the really cool things about bearing fruit is that it's not just about self-serving, but it is what allows us to also be able to give to others. To me, one of the real challenges is for us to go deep together. At our healthiest, We do this, yes, as individuals looking at ourselves in the mirrors, but also we have a responsibility to do this as communities. At our healthiest, we're willing to dig around and to make room for growth in many different areas of our lives and in our community's life. We look around for ways that we can dig deeper and broaden our fruit bearing, but it requires us to recognize who we are first, ways that we are willing to commit to growth and change and development. Our job is not to throw manure on other people. It does them no good to heap suggestions of ways that they can be better or do it right. Rather, what it does is it invites us to carve out spaces in our own lives and in our own communities so that we might receive that fertilization, that compost, that manure, those nutrients, making room so that it might lead to a healthier, fuller, and fruit-bearing life. Jesus, in this passage and in this parable today, is calling on us to turn from blaming God or presidential candidates 
or society and culture, or just others, whoever others may be, be it your boss or your spouse, for what's wrong in the world and what's wrong in our lives. We are called to take a look at ourselves, reflecting inward at our own journey and considering where we might need to make a change or to turn in a new direction or to be open to a new possibility. None of us, if we're honest with ourselves, can say that we're acting or behaving in the fullness of who God desires for us to be. All of us, all of us can benefit from being cultivated, from having our faith freshened up. Most of us could use some manure on our lives. And so we have the Isaiah text today. I like what John said, it's liquid spirituality. They are words of great fertilizing Hear this, everyone, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come, buy, eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. And eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. We are invited to come and to experience the ever flowing nourishment of life in Christ. It's not going to be perfect. There are going to be times when we feel like we have no fruit to give or bear, but we will find. Jesus there to nurture us with rich food if we will but come we have to be willing to make space in our lives this text from Isaiah may seem like an indulgent and extravagant metaphor during the season of Lent when we typically focus on sacrifice and simplicity but this metaphor is really about relationship and nourishment. There is milk and honey overflowing. And we are invited and asked to love others and to, to delight ourselves in this rich, rich food. Yes, there will be times of uncertainty and times when we don't see it or taste it. And so we have to be reminded of it. And so today I'm glad you're here. Because we are here to be reminded that we are each a beautiful child of God. That we are a reflection of God and God lives in and through us. Go look in the mirror. And see all that's there. And know that it's good. But also, allow some digging to take place around yourself. And in the communities that you are a part of. I invite us to do so as a community of St. James. What might this look like? Because when we dig around... We can know and trust and expect that there's going to be fertilizer and nutrients and manure there that will help us grow and to produce some new fruit. I believe that the, the fig tree does not get cut down. I'm sure of it, in fact, because I know and believe that we serve a God who doesn't give up on us. And who believes in us. A God whose grace flows like milk and honey. And it's for you. And it's for me. And it's for us as a community. And this, my friends, is good news for us today. Let us pray. 
God of grace and God of glory. We humbly ask that you reveal yourself to us today so that we might be a true reflection of your grace and love. Help us to see ourselves and others in this love that you so bountifully pour out for us. God, we ask that you reveal to us places in our own lives and in, the, in our own communities where we need to do some digging so that we might experience more deeply the joy of life with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today, our hymn of invitation, is hymn number 396, O Jesus, I Have Promised. I invite you to stand as you're able and let us sing together verses 1, 3, and 4 of number 396. Two things. One, a shovel is a great tool for digging. I invite you to do some digging in your life. Find a shovel or a trowel or a pick fork, whatever you need, and do some, will, some digging. Second thing, I didn't bring you a shovel to take home, but I did bring you a mirror. And I invite you to take a mirror as you leave today. You'll find them in a basket outside the narthex. And look into it. That one's a small version. Go home and look in a bigger version. And be reminded that you are a reflection of God. That you are a child of God. That you are beloved. And I invite you to go forth, finding some space, carving out some room in your life so that you might experience the abundance of God's grace and joy and love that is for each one of us. Go dig, do, do some digging. Go forward in the grace and the peace and the love of Christ. Amen. Oh, to act with you.
Just a 